life has been unfaithful and it promised oh so much. Those are the opening lines to the second single from the second Manic Street Preachers album, Gold Against the Soul. Today, uh, episode 158 of Mark Talks About His Things, I'm going to talk about this underloved, underappreciated, absolutely bloody brilliant album by one of my favourite bands, Manic Street Preachers. Um, this album has been written out of history, very unfairly, I think, by very many people as some kind of embarrassment. Um, when, perhaps if I can speak so frankly, the real embarrassment of the Manic's career is yet to come. Um, this album came out in the summer of 1993. And as I mentioned in a previous episode, they finished the Generation Terrorists era with the release of the single Little Baby Nothing and some shows in December 1992 and then went to the studio, a place called Hook End Manor, a residential studio, I think it's near Reading, uh, to record a second album, The Hypocrites, Sellouts, of course, without um, necessarily being cognizant of the fact that, as William Burroughs himself said, is every agent defects, every artist sells out. And you cannot dis destroy or replace the whale, you can only operate inside the whale, being a subversive element within it. And the Manic Street Preachers here, as, as to quote a line from, I think, Nostalgic Pusshead, is that rebellion always sells for a profit. And this is what they were trying to do, is they were trying to operate inside a system they were not strong enough to change, but they were strong enough to be a lone voice against the choir. This is an album really out of time. 1993 was a very strange time in British culture. Uh, Britpop had yet to take off. The beginnings of it were starting to flower. Uh, so Suede, Pulp, Saint Etienne, Blur made uh, Modern Life is Rubbish. You could see the beginnings of, of what was to become the frankly fetid nostalgia that was the, the empty roar of Britpop that was about to come. And the Manics had always said they'd release one album, sell 16 million copies, play Wembley Stadium and then split up. Hence, of course, hypocrites. But they weren't, because this is what they were doing, is that they were carrying on. The mission was not yet complete. Um, Generation Terrorist was a very outward looking album, I think, and it was a very it was a it was a very flawed album in some respects. It wasn't necessarily uh, really as successful as perhaps it could have been. It was too long, had too many songs on it had the wrong track listing, um, and the band only headlined Kilburn National, not Wembley Stadium, which Kilburn was approximately 1 70th of the size of the Wembley Stadium. They did also say that they were going to play in the burnt-out rubble of Buckingham Palace, which they didn't quite get to do, but they did headline the Royal Albert Hall a few years later, which was almost the same thing. Um, I rate this album really, really highly. I know a lot of uh, the band especially don't rate gold against the soul i really disagree with them uh, and, and let me kind of explain why it's a really important album to me as well because it, it beyond your your first initial kind of phase all bands kind of just leap straight out of the traps and they're full of ideals and ideas and they've got concepts and visions and integrity and slowly bit by bit the world gets in uh, Richie himself said at one point that the only perfect circle in the world was the eye of a baby and then it became corrupted with everything that it saw from the moment that it was born. Uh, he would have been brilliant at Twitter, um, but it's those kind of statements that you weren't getting from anybody else. You know, if you asked, I don't know, Fred from Northside or some idiot from Blaggers ITA, you know, they wouldn't, necess they wouldn't be able to articulate anything like that at all. Where I was when I was growing up was a really lonely place. Records were my best friends. I did have actual human, real, in-life, touchable friends that you could talk to. Uh, and if you were really, really lucky, they might go out with you, assuming that, you know, you weren't horrendously horrific. Um, but the Manics were like friends that lived in, in my record player. And my CD player, they understood and explained and articulated feelings and ideas about the reality that I lived in that no other band at that point came anywhere close to vocalising at all. Um, I really struggled with being 17, 18, 19. Uh, I was very lucky to meet a very, very wonderful person uh, and have a very good relationship that, that transformed me from, from an awkward and shy boy who was scared of everything and, and gamely trying to, to bluff my way through it into being, you know, a relatively rounded adult. And you may not necessarily think it. I mean, how, how could somebody have 
some form of anxiety or some crisis of confidence when they're quite happy to talk to uh, their mobile phone and by extension literally dozens of people on the internet about things which are really quite intimate um, how could that person have some form of anxiety well you've got to remember what uh, Robbie Williams uh, said uh, which was also a theory that Michael Hutchins had is the uh, thing called the ego jacket where he puts on a jacket when he's about to perform and then he becomes somebody with that name who is different like all the things that you wanted to be but you can't be uh, almost like the way that Clark Kent transforms into Superman obviously this is a pretty poor impersonation of Superman this is a very good impersonation of Clark Kent with the glasses uh, of what you mean Lois and um, so Gold Against the Soul was for me uh, the most mature Manix album today released in the summer of 1993 and it, it started off with uh, a debut, well, the first single from the album, From Despair to Wear. Here is the CD single of From Despair to Wear, which only has one new track apart from From Despair to Wear. And it's also backed with Spectators of Suicide and Star Lover, the heavenly versions that are taken from the, from the early singles that were released on Heavenly Records. And uh, it's a, a fairly kind of basic package. I bought the CD single because I couldn't find the original You Love Us single. And so, therefore, that's why they put it on there as Star Lover and Spectators of Suicide. But From Despair to Wear was an amazing single. I heard that. And uh, even now, it's like one of those songs where if I needed to, I could reel off every lyric from it. Um, I lie there alone in my bed. I've poisoned every room in the house. This place is quiet and so alone. Um, and it, it's a song that, for me, is around, well, what happens when, when you know, what happens after that? You know, the, um, the the French philosopher whose name I've temporarily forgotten because I couldn't be bothered to look it up said life com commences on the other side of despair. It's like, right, OK, so you've gone to the brink and you haven't jumped over the edge. And there's the bit after the end of the credits where people walk off into the sunset. What happens when the sun actually sets? This is from Despair to Wear. It's a song about, I think, despair and existential crisis, about some kind of reckoning around, well, who am I? What am I? Who am I going to be now that I've I've managed to to carve out for me some form of it's it's not quite a midlife crisis but it's almost like a, an album the whole of Gold Against the Soul as an album is about necessarily what it's like to to live with the realization that you are now an adult that you are now no longer a child that things like you know, tax and employment and HR and 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 work and all these things are real things that not only do you have to live with you have to reckon with them and you have to either live with their presence or their absence every day in your life um, and when I find that tetrapod that crawled out from the uh, the river and decided it wanted to walk on the land I am going to have serious words because now I have to deal with things like work and bills okay tetrapods if you'd stayed in the water for billion years ago I wouldn't be doing any of this right now I'd probably be dead actually because uh, most humans died much younger uh, than this until relatively recently you know if you looked at you know the average human lifespan in the year uh, 1821 I almost definitely would have died of dysentery probably no more than at the age of 32 to 35 um, so I am now practically immortal if we judge everything by 1821 standards and that is where civilization has led us from Despair to Wear is a brilliant song. I, I absolutely adore it. It has a meaning to me that goes far beyond words or music. It's a song around doggedly, determinedly carrying on and trying to stay true to your ideals in a world that wants to bend you to its callous and heartless will with every day and with every action. When the world tells you that what you really need is a car and a house and a mortgage and a dog and three children and holidays in the Canary Islands every six months. And that is the thing that you will be chasing for the rest of your life. Um, John Lennon says, you know, the secret of life was to be happy. And that was the thing that I was chasing when this was age and happiness in whatever form it came. I wasn't going to compromise on that. Um, and, you know, people change over time. The B side of From Despair to Wear is a song called Hibernation, uh, which I think opens with the lyric, we got married because we should, and has, uh, you know, a, 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 a lyric around how choosing a house because it's got easy access to the city, marrying because the world thinks that that's what you should do when you get to a certain age. 
Uh, I remember having an argument with with my my partner who you know did the old age thing. Who says when I was a child I played with childish things, and now that I'm no longer a child I've put the childish things away. And um, we had a you know I remember a distinct conversation about me going well look I I don't you know jeans and band t-shirts that is who I am that's still who I am you know surrounding myself with with um, obviously a portable uh, museum of modern music that was who I was music was the map that helped me traverse the world when I was lost within it obviously I had friends and influences and books and other things that helped that happen but music was the map that showed me where I was in the world when I was lost. I was not going to put that away because music was not a childish thing. Music was a design for life. It was a new art riot, a way of understanding how the world around me operated. And the world didn't make sense until I had discovered music, until I discovered bands, until I discovered art. And the great thing about the Manic Street Preachers is everything that they did, it was kind of like reading a library set to rock music it was fantastic you didn't come away from the manix thinking oh i found a new band you go when when i encountered the manix in uh, 19, 19, 1991 i didn't think oh uh, you know it's a band i like i was like this isn't a band this is a way of life this is a way of thinking this is a way of engaging with the world around me you know they had uh, you know quotes from from authors on every song on generation terrorists and those weren't chosen to look cool they didn't look cool they were they looked arch and pretentious and stupid and full of ideas and you know you're you're just stupid taffs from wales and there was a lot of casual racism at that point around it you know some of the headlines that the band had to deal with were undoubtedly racist uh, and and very kind of xenophobic, making jokes about you know sheep and dragons and all that type of bullshit, and they're going no you know we're we're a band that have come out of nowhere, and we have been driven by a desire that burnt like a flame to make the world or to make our world uh, make sense in some form, and mu- they, for them music was the way of making sense of the world around them that otherwise didn't do so. Now um, Generation Terrorists is very outward looking, Gold Against the Soul is very inward looking it's it's not narcissistic as such but it's very in it's got a lot of interior monologues it's looking at the self and examining the self especially in the song yourself around who you are now that you are you know unavoidably you have two options either you you die young or you live until you get old you know and, and the third option which is obviously becoming a vampire and turning into the lost boys like keith the sutherland and then walking around topless playing a saxophone with a mullet wasn't actually an option outside of the movies sorry to break your hearts there uh, i did consider it for a while um, as an option uh, but obviously the ponytail doesn't suit me um, and yes i did have one for a while gold against the soul is i think a brilliant Annex album and it needs more love and more attention that comes in it. It opens with I think one of the finest opening songs on any album ever which is called Sleep Flower. Sleep Flower is a a curling unfolding riff a song that slowly builds and suddenly it explodes it's a riff that sounds like a can opener or perhaps the buzzing of an angry swarm of bees uh, and then it kind of opens up and then the song suddenly leaps out of the traps like a bullet out of a gun and it doesn't stop it's it's one of the best opening tracks on any album ever and you know the chorus to sleep for hour goes it feels like i'm missing pieces of sleep a memory phase to a pale landscape you are an extinction an impossibility uh, and I've always struggled with sleep I've always struggled with being able to get to sleep and to stay to sleep and it's only in the past five years that I've found a medication that allows me to shut up the voice in my head I can't stop thinking sleep cannot thought the cannot stop the thoughts splitting through my mind and god damn it I try and and sleep flower is just a song about insomnia and you know the, the cliche is if you don't sleep you can't do anything but if you sleep, you can do something, which is something in itself. And for me, I spent almost all of my life until my mid-40s in a state of constant exhaustion uh, because I couldn't sleep, I couldn't get to sleep. And there was always a voice in my head going, if you thought about this, what would happen if that happens? Have you considered... Now, remember this thing that happened to you 12 years ago? And I'm like, just shut the fuck up. I'm trying to get to sleep. But my brain said, no. And do you remember when you did that? You shouldn't have done that. That was stupid, but you were drunk. And I'll give you a pass on that, but you don't do it again. 
That's the kind of stuff that happens when you have insomnia. Is all the monsters come out in the dark and you can't see them. Um, and it's a, you know, sleep flower is a song about basically just not being able to get any sleep. And Faithless's Insomnia is a good song, but Sleep Flower really covers what it's like to be sleepless. Um, here's the uh, the original 1993 CD of Gold Against the Soul. I have three copies of Gold Against the Soul on CD. Um, the first release was a gold CD. This is a promo CD, uh, which I got from Hall or Nothing, and so therefore isn't gold. Um, one of the great things, by the way, I should point out, is the Manx really came from fanzine culture. They really understood with fanzine culture is that fanzines were an, a way of, of spreading the word about your music. If you couldn't get into the enemy or the Melody Maker or Sands or Kerrang, although the Manx were very well taken up by all of those, they kept those links to fanzines all the way through. And so around about 1993, I realised if you rang up Paul or nothing, you could probably get free shit. So yes, they sent me a CD of Gold Against the Cell uh, before it came out. Not long before it came out, but before it came out. Uh, and this is the band in, I think, the studio in Hookend Manor, which I think is also seen in the video to Morris's Ouija board, uh, which is a bizarre room, but so be it. You know, the idea of the Mannix being in a position of domesticity like this um, is, is unusual. You wouldn't necessarily have thought that a rock band would be doing this, but at the same point, they're sat there and they're kind of going, well, you know, we're not necessarily being domesticated, but we're certainly now becoming you know, more aware uh, of, of what it is to be domesticated. And one of the things that I got off Hall or Nothing as well, by the way, I should point out, was this uh, four-track cassette uh, chopped out at the Hit Factory in London, uh, which has uh, Sleep Flower, Room Despair to Wear, uh, Symphony of Tourette and Gold Against the Soul. Um, it's probably quite rare now. I'm not sure how many of these there were. Maybe a dozen or something like that. Um, but this is a, a non-Dolby advanced listening cassette of four tracks of um, Gold Against the Soul. When we get to um, Sleep Flower, of course, uh, it has some fantastic lyrics in it, which I've mentioned before. Um, where where the chorus goes, you know, it feels like I'm missing pieces of sleep. A memory fades to a pale landscape. You were an extinction, a desert heat, a blind illness of my anxiety. Um, wow. Well, nobody would really. I mean, when I was younger, things like mental health, things like insomnia, anxiety, they weren't really understood in uh, films and culture. You know, when people were talking about madness, it was. Silence of the Lambs. The, the preconception, if you had some degree of mental health issue, was that you were automatically going to start cooking your neighbours, killing them, eating them, and serve fried penis to your girlfriend, or something along those lines. And there was a lot of ignorance around mental health, there was a lot of ignorance around anxiety, a lot of illness around insomnia. People didn't understand it. And in the days before the internet, it was very, very difficult to get access to information that was meaningful around this so i felt very very alone it was only when lyrics like that really happened that i kind of realized that you know i'm not the only person in this world that has this bizarre uh, or maybe difficult uh, issue uh, and also um one of the other things was that you know um people that have uh mental health issues people that have autism you know we're really really good at masking we're really good at, at, at you know playing out a role and presenting ourselves as regular normal human beings uh, and, and not showing any weaknesses because firstly when i was at school if you showed weaknesses that was that was a, a siren um, to be attacked to be bullied uh, and to be victimized and this is not you know a, a victim mentality this is what happened people um kind of like sniffed out weakness or any perceived weakness and they descended like a pack of, of, of cruel wolves upon you for showing the slightest bit of, of weakness or fragility um and this is one of the one of the things that made it really really difficult you know you're always kind of fighting an invisible monster that lived in your own head and at the same time you know you're having to present normal to the rest of the world because you were a secret agent i felt certainly when i was perhaps not as well as I am now or not as well as I have been for a number of years when I was much much younger I was extremely unhappy and at the same point I was always also kind of presenting a relatively happy exterior you know I had some traumatic events when I was younger I had a lot of poverty I had an absolutely fucking atrocious first relationship that was nothing to do with me in its atrociousness it was all down to that person's behavior where I was effectively being abused and I managed to escape from that 
Um, but what happens is you end up presenting a normal outlook to everyone else. So people don't think there's anything wrong with you, because if there's something wrong with you, people will look for any reason whatsoever uh, to damage your prospects or to victimise you. Or perhaps some people would see you as somebody that they could exploit in the concept of either a romantic or a relationship or a business environment. So I was masking who I was and I was playing a role of somebody else in order to fit into a society that may very well have... Uh, shunned me or ruined me or in other, some other way attacked me for being anything less than utterly normal uh, and I mean nobody's normal everybody's weird in some respect uh, but for me at least um, this music was the first expression I had of not fitting into the world around me I felt like a square peg being forced into a round hole by a reality that just simply wasn't good enough life has been unfaithful and it promised oh so much which were the first two lines of La Tristesse Jurera um, which means the sadness will never go away um, and uh, it's a La Tristesse de is, is is one of the finest songs that has ever been written, released, performed by anybody. It's some bizarre kind of rock baggy crossover uh, inspired by uh, a French poet, I believe, or a French artist um, who said those exact words. And La Tristesse de um has some very powerful uh, lyrics it's it's got some you know lyrics about uh, grasping with and dealing with you know your identity and what it is and so there's a there's a line about and gold against the soul by the way as an album overall has this same kind of approach um has these lyrics around around meaning and understanding and so la tristesse Gerrera, by the way and i've gone for the lyric book here uh, because the lyric books definitely make more sense when they're written down is it said, you know, as far as I was concerned, you know, I was exploiting the very thing that cheapened me by going to work. So my intellect, my abilities, you know, obviously I, I've got a better relationship now to that. But there were times when I was that age and I was very definitely underpaid. And I knew that, you know, I wasn't going to get an inheritance as such. I wasn't going to get anything else. I had to crawl my way uh, hand by hand, finger by finger, inch by inch, out of what felt to be a bucket of shit and poverty, which I've been given uh, growing up in a suburban Birmingham. I really didn't like it. And, you know, I was taught a very, very clear, very hard message by money. And that was a face, my face being pushed against a hard object in, in something that was designed to humiliate me. And, and by the way, the, one of, the, one of the, the, the last verses of the title track itself uh, gold against the soul is um you know they they talk about um fossilize make yorkshire into a tourist resort and dream of new ways to humble the poor this was the world that i lived in it would have been conservative role since 1979 and the conservatives were not ruling with the best wishes of the people they were ruling in order to make themselves and their friends rich and richer and somehow people were doffing their caps to them and still voting for them and they wanted to humiliate and humble the poor they wanted to make the poor invisible slaves whilst they enjoyed their life in relative luxury that was the gold against the soul and that was the thing which i saw in in my life from a very very early age you know and there's a the the lyric in in la tristesse Jurera, um where he goes you know i sold my medal it paid a bill it sells at the market market stalls and parades milan catwalks around you know selling the achievements of your glories in order to pay bills you know compromising what you have for the financial necessity and you've got to remember by the way in my opinion society is structured in such a way so that when we have people arguing amongst ourselves we are not necessarily able to have the resources or the or the the ability to com to to comprehend the fact that there are people that want to set us fighting amongst ourselves so that they can continue with looting um, the country the planet and and the world uh, for their own embetterment you know no one evil works in darkness it's never going to stand up and say to you hey guys i'm ripping you off it what it will do is go look over there there's the immigrants there's the poor those are the people that are your enemies whilst you know stealing away billions and trillions of pounds um and la tristesse Gerrera is, is is for me you know one of the the most powerful songs on the album uh it's certainly got um you know uh, a lyric around uh 
People send postcards. They all hope I'm feeling better. Hope I'm feeling well. I retreat into self pity. It's so easy where they patronise my misery. You know the idea that people, when people go, "How are you?" They're not necessarily re- they're not prepared for the answer. They just want to go. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm I'm good. You know, everything's good. Everything's fine. They're looking for um, necessarily, you know, uh, a confirmation that everything is okay in the world when everything is not is not okay. Track four on the album is is, is yourself. Um, when I said it's narcissistic as an album, it isn't, but it's very inward looking. So yourself is is around you know the physical um, object that you are is is trying. How how do you present to the world? What what image do you put forth? around that so you know the the lyric opens with your ritual every day a mild show of soak in aftershave best clothes do your best look in the mirror go on um, and it, and it's around you know how you present yourself uh, to the rest of the world everyone is perfect and you're so lame free scent burns your skin and no smell can really sco- cover sin it it's um yeah a song of self-loathing and it's a song of awareness and it's a song around the gap between your presentation, your outside version and your inside version. You think about a taxidermied animal on the outside. It looks like an animal on the inside. It's all collapsing into nothing. It's just reinforced so that the inside can't get out. So, you know, in some respects, yourself um, is, is a song about you know, vision and identity and, and who you are or how you, how you perceive yourself to be. Um, that's song four. Uh, happy songs do appear but on other bands albums by the way uh, not on Manic Street Preachers ones uh, last song on, on track track uh, track five side one is life becoming a landslide and again it's a rejection of of, of adulthood it's a rejection of, of maturity you know the chorus is I don't want to be a man and with the the context around it is, you know, at the time in the early 90s, no band was talking about toxic masculinity. No band was talking about abusive male role models. You know, everyone was going on about Gaza wearing a pair of plastic tits as he came off the plane on the way back from playing football somewhere. Oh, he's an alcoholic. He's a fucking lad, etc., etc., etc. And no one was going, hang on, that's a really unhealthy image to show. You know, in the same way that James Bond as a, a role model is a really unhealthy image to show because he's got a very... Uh, kind of like shallow uh, consumerist transactional approach to things like relationships. Um, there was still, you know, hair metal for all its enormous number of sins. Bands like Def Leppard, Cherry Pie, Nelson, Warrant, idiotic music made by idiots in spandex who, if um, if they actually had a meaningful human feeling, would probably run screaming from it and make a joke about something to do with tits and women. And, and you know this was this was the thing that in in the album Gold Against the Cell, although the manics on the outside were were dealing with and approaching with all of the the issues about standard conventional rock bands, they sounded like a rock band, they sang like a rock band, and at the same point they had this vulnerable, wounded kind of approach, which was I don't want to be a man. Life has been unfaithful. I've poisoned every room in the house. I feel like I'm missing pieces of sleep. Um, you know. Uh, it's a very strong refutation of all of the the, the cliches of, of of masculinity. It's one of the most feminine masculine albums that there is, um, you know. And it and uh, it, it's really. I mean, I could just sit here and go, God, man, this band took thoughts I didn't even know I had and articulated them. Uh, and obviously, the alternative, as I said, is that you either grow old. Or you don't, and and the band had no choice but to grow old. But at this point, they're still wrestling with what is identity, what is humanity, what is my role, what is adulthood, who am I? Um, you flip the album over onto side two. Uh, here's an original vinyl edition of the album, by the way, from 1993. Uh, probably quite rare now. It's got some uh, interesting memorabilia inside, which I will show you shortly. Uh, but you flip the uh, the album over onto side two it doesn't have its original inner sleeve i'm afraid uh, and then you get drug drug druggy uh, which is a an interesting song i think interesting covers a multitude of sins by the way uh, but drug drug druggy is a song which is uh, around mm, pleasure 
and how you anaesthetise yourself. And of course, the, the lyric around this also refers to a number of drugs. So it might not be MDMA or um, ecstasy, heroin, cocaine. It could be paracetamol and ibuprofen, you know. Um, and I can't face the sunlight and the dirt outside. I want to stay in where this darkness don't lie. And it, it's kind of like anaesthetising yourself with with access to, to, to drugs and um, things like that. Strange song. It's not necessarily clear exactly what it is. It's not the best lyric that there ever was, uh, but it was very good live. And then you get to Roses in the Hospital. Roses in the Hospital, third single off the album. At this point, I should probably show you some singles as opposed to just merely talking about them, by the way. This is uh, Roses in the Hospital, the seven inch. Uh, the seven inch was re recorded with new vocals, um, and uh, it's a, a red vinyl here of Roses in the Hospital. It's backed with Us Against You, which is the, 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 the kind of lead in point for the next album. It's the first song where you go, Oh, I see where you're going. Uh, and there's a 12 inch that's backed with a fuck ton of remixes, obviously. And some of the remixes, not good, some of the remixes, very good indeed of Roses in the Hospital. Um, and it's a song about, well, Roses in the Hospital. Although it's obviously musically a complete uh, rip-off of Sound and Vision by David Bowie. And frankly, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. It, it's got a lyric which I kind of listened to and I thought, wow, they're really, they're really saying that. You know, it's about pull my fingernails out. I want to cling to something soft. Progressing like a constant war. There's no one to feel ashamed for. Um, and part of it, to me in Roses in the Hospital is about, well, you know, Roses in the Hospital as an image, like smokers outside the hospital doors. It's a, it's a powerful image around, you know, human compassion and empathy, but ultimately it's fucking useless because you don't need Roses in the Hospital. What you need is treatment and to get well. You don't need Roses. I don't want Roses. I want Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi and, and good health. Um, and... The, the chorus kind of goes, you know, we don't want your fucking love. And that was a very, that was a bit that they re-recorded for the single. Uh, to him to sing Roses in the Hospital. But it also uh, quotes uh, liberally. It also features an ad-lib of Rudy, Rudy, Rudy Gonna Fail, which is a, a Clash song. Now, some people say, oh, you know, they're, they're such rip-offs of the Clash. And, like, well, has, if it's an original thought to you, it may not be an original thought to somebody else. But it's an original thought to you and it's what you believe, then you know, that's that's original, that's valid, that's a form of expression. Um, in the same way that, you know, if uh, if when Trent Reznor wrote hers, he wrote the first Johnny Cash song, it just happened to be recorded under the name of, of Nine Inch Nails. Uh, then we have track eight, Nostalgic Pusshead, which I think is a you know, that and Symphony of Tourette and Gold Against the Soul, closing three piece of the, the album, really kind of leading into something that's that's pretty um, pretty heavy, actually. So Nostalgic Pusshead is around the way in which um, society seemed to be very good. I mean, especially around things like The Doors. And, and old bands were really popular in the early 90s. You know, The Doors were, were big stuff. Um, you know, and, and Queen was still huge and they've been going for 15 years. And nowadays that's old man's music. Yeah, the Rolling Stones were still a thing. Yeah, although they probably shouldn't have been a thing. And um, by the way, this is a Japanese CD uh, of Gold Against the Soul. It's got some slightly different photographs in it. Um, the Nostalgic Pusshead is, is really a song around, you know, the way that you glorify your past when the future dries up. Um, it's, it's a very uh, pointed clear song uh, that, that makes very very clear its feelings about certain things um, there's a, a, a lyric uh, around you know my contemporaries are so in control fuck you fuck you I grunt and groan I can't keep it no more and and oh no sorry that's Symphony of Tourette um, but uh, yeah Nostalgic Pusshead is around the way is it's almost a list of things. So it's like, I'm a face of fashion in Soho Square. My ties, Paul Smith or Gaultier. My cheeks, blood red as my favourite port. But hey, cocaine keeps not keeps cholesterol at bay. And it's a, you know, a song which is going, well, where's the new ideas? Where's the new things that go on? And, and it kind of follows Symphony of Tourette, which is a, 
a song around what happens when you, you when you know that as i said earlier when people mask their behaviors what happens what's going on underneath and symptom Tourette feels like a you know a bubbling explosion of lava barely contained rage um that uh, uh, you know some indefinable something that has offended thee uh, whereas guild against the soul the last track on the album is this this long ponderous almost guns and roses style rocket queen style um kind of epic but at the same point it's a song that very very clearly is about human subjugation subjugation slavery uh, and money and employment uh, and the way that power and money are used to control millions of people by by fiercely uh, and, and tightly controlling available resources to create artificial scarcity so people are fighting amongst themselves for food and water and air and land and space and love so that the real the, the real evil the real demons of society the people that are creaming off from the top and not creating anything the parasites that are feeding upon the people around them those people get away with murder and robbery you know uh, uh, the, the opening lyric is somebody told me to vote conservative tragedy is not known under this dimmest of lights you know the the perception was that people that voted conservative were merely and report were merely temporarily embarrassed millionaires um, and the idea was that you know if you if you play the lottery one day you will win it could be you and and gold against the soul as a song is very very clearly going no it won't be you you're a sucker you've been had um, it's a very powerful song that uh, they've never played it live, you know. Um, but there's that that lyric about close the pits, sanctify Roy Lynn and OBE, shareholding a piece of this fucking country, fossilize, make Yorkshire, Yorkshire into a tourist resort, and dream up new ways to humble the poor. A thousand Marlborough deaths ignored every day, and who gives a shit about sexuality? gold destroyed the soul and that's exactly true you know every agent defects and every artist sells out and, and it's something around the album which i don't think has ever really been really addressed the album has been underappreciated because it was the manic second album they automatically sold out when they didn't split and didn't headline Wembley Stadium and didn't sell 16 million copies of the album and therefore of course it doesn't matter Whereas this is the album which questions it goes, what happens when you go off into the sunset? Where do you go next? Who are you? What are you going to be? What are you going to stand for? Um, and so that was Gold Against the Soul, the Max Street Preacher's second album. It is fucking brilliant. I love it. And uh, anybody that wants to disagree with me, uh, stick to your bloody Def Leppard albums or whatever. Um, the Japanese version has a, a lyric sheet which is translated. Uh, into Japanese. It also has, by the way, a very, very unusual and unique cover. So this is the Gold Against the Soul uh, 2 CD version that was uh, the initial edition that was released in Japan. It's a 10-track album, and uh, all the albums released in Japan are meant to have bonus tracks on there because of some kind of tax implication that makes it cheaper to import CDs from elsewhere. However, for Gold Against the Soul, there was a live in Japan EP uh, that was included on the cd uh, sadly um the this this disc case is so rare and difficult to get um that i cannot replace it even though a couple of the stubs have, have kind of snapped off but the second disc on there is uh, live at the club club Sita in uh, kawasaki on the 13th of may 1992 uh, which also features the first album appearance of motown junk um and it's a it's um a five song ep uh, really guys stick it out on vinyl again you know, and uh, make it a proper release um, but there's gold against the soul that's the japanese version of the album that was released and it comes in this, this very thick chunky nice case that feels like you've spent a lot of money on it um, because if you're importing cds from japan you have and that's that um right that's me talking about the album i haven't talked about anything else yet and I really, really need to. So the second single was released from the album. The second single released from the album was La Tristessa Jurera, which I've mentioned previously as one of the best Manic songs of all time. Uh, this is a 12-inch single of La Tristessa Jurera. It's backed with a track called Patrick Bateman, uh, which the band played live on the October 1992 tour, uh, which was uh, seven and a half minutes long. And it's also backed with a live version of Repeat and the original demo of Tennessee. Tennessee come and I get low. 
This version, I think, originally had a poster, and the poster is still in here. It's a 20 inch by 30 inch poster. I've not actually opened this poster for at least two decades. Uh, let's see what it is. There it is. Uh, look, there's a picture of a band member. That's the band standing there in Hookins, uh, Manor Studios, I believe. Um, so, uh, having Tennessee on it, Tennessee is the B side of the first single, Suicide Alley. So, uh, no need to buy Suicide Alley unless you really, really do need to buy Suicide Alley. Patrick Bateman was the first song from the album. It was a song that when I heard it, and I kind of thought, okay, there's going to be a second album. This band isn't just going to disappear into a puff of glory after having released one 18 song album. Um, I mean, obviously, where, where do you go from there, from despair to where? Uh, it was released as a CD single as well, which is uh, backed with What's My Name and Slash and Burn live. The version of Tennessee is only on the 12 inch. And I think uh, it's also got What's My Name, which is a Clash song recorded in Cambridge, October 1992. I didn't know the Clash at the time, so I couldn't say whether it was any good or not. To me, it was just a new Manic song. But La Tristessa Chirera is one of the, the best singles that they ever did. There was also, a, again, an exclusive Japanese version that came in a different sleeve um, and had a different back cover. Uh, there's a you know, the image there of a teardrop itself. And the lyric is uh, printed on the on the sleeve there, as well as a, a, a lovely, nice kind of fold-out booklet with lots of pictures of the band members on it. It also has um, uh, Tennessee and Repeat Live and Slash and Burn. So it's got all the songs off the 12 inches, the 7 inches, you know, all the various formats of La Tristessa Gerrera are all available on the Japanese CD single. Uh, finally, we have the, um, well, not finally, we've got the third single from the album, uh, the wonderful looking, sexy and svelte, uh, Roses in the Hospital. This is, um, again, one of my finest, uh, one, of, one of the finest Manic songs. It's uh, backed with uh, six remixes on here, which is pretty surprising, actually. Um, and on here, it's got uh, a B-sides of Us Against You, Donkeys, which I've seen the band play twice which is one of their best B-sides, and a cover version of Happy Monday's Rope for Luck. It's a brilliant, brilliant um, single. I mean, at this point, I, I, I just love everything that they, they did. Uh, no ifs, no buts. Um, in Japan, Gold Against the Soul was released as a mid-price version. Uh, this version, backed with the remixes of Roses in the Hospital, that previously were only available on vinyl. Uh, they also played a show at Milton Keynes Bowl, supporting Bon Jovi, of all people, which was broadcast on, on the radio and was released in 1994 as a bootleg CD called For Real, uh, which I bought because it had uh, this track on. It also had a studio recording of their cover version of Nirvana's Penny Royalty. Uh, but the fourth single from the album, and the one that I've only got on CD single, is Life Becoming a Landslide, uh, backed with Comfort Comes, Our Mother Saints, and I think a cover version of I think it, I think it's McCluskey's Charles Windsor, um, which I didn't know at all. Uh, which is another song. Oh, written by McCarthy. Sorry, McCarthy. Um, but great song about the Royals. Repeat after me, fuck Queen and country. Um, and in 2020, there was a, a kind of a book two CD version of it, which was backed with a number of the B sides, and approximately 12 13 demos and some remixes as well um, i really wish they put all of the deluxe versions of all of the albums in the same size covers and packages um, here's some pictures of the band again staring out looking moody uh, all photographs taken by mitch akita um, who was the, the band's photographer and did a um has done tour programs and cover art and lots of things like that Oh man, that smells, that smells new. Nothing smells as good as something that smells new. And then there's a typewritten version of the lyrics. And then you've got the two CDs in there. The, the last thing I did promise to show you, by the way, uh, inside my, my LP of God Against the Soul, is a couple of little bits of memorabilia which I've got here. So we have uh, an A5 kind of countertop leaflet, which advertises the album and the tour dates. I saw them at uh, Wolverhampton, Civic Hall on the uh, 9th of July. I also saw them in Swansea play Singleton Park on the 7th of August 1993, which was a free show uh, sponsored by Heineken, which had a riot in it. One of the most scary experiences I've ever seen, by the way. 
um, is a, a, a riot and then we've got um, an 8x10 promo photo of the band as I said before you write to um, you know uh, you write to Hall or nothing they send you stuff here's a stage use set list from the Leicester de Montfort University or Leicester Polytechnic Arena and on the 26th of January 1994 they opened with Motown junk uh, the stage was covered in uh, camouflage netting you know they were very heavily leaning and this is by the way is one of the, the rarer things it's a Manic Street Preachers gold coloured uh, plastic bag that um, contains uh, a press release for the album some text uh, from Richie uh, uh, kind of like a manifesto statement which actually I might I might uh, I might put that on and on Instagram later on. Uh, that had also had the uh, the eight by ten in it. There's another copy of the, the stage. Uh, sorry, the, the kind of like the record shop giveaway thing. And here, oh, a bit of a jigsaw. Well, I wasn't expecting that. That's unusual and unexpected. And then finally, a piece of paper. Uh, oh, that's interesting. That's got the uh, the opening times for various museums on it. And what looks to be another part of a jigsaw. Well, I'm sorry about that. You've had an unexpected uh, tour of various other things. Um, look, I ain't going to muck about. I love Gold Against the Soul. It's underrated. Uh, not enough people give it enough love. It's a fierce, uncompromising album about wrestling with your own identity as you become an adult um, in the shape of a, an, un an uncaring, unchanging world that seems cruel, baffling and, and barely comprehensible as well as being set against the power dynamic of capitalism. I think it's one of the finest albums ever made. I love it to bits and um, I can't do any more than, than tell you just how absolutely brilliant it is. So stay beautiful. I will see you all soon. And uh, yeah, that's it. Stay lovely. See you, see you later. Bye. Stay beautiful.